Welcome to What She Said, the heartbeat of Canadian women's voices with me, your host, Candace Sampson. Here we dive deep into the raw, unfiltered stories and triumphs of women from coast to coast. This isn't just a podcast, it's a movement where empowerment and education collide and where mansplaining is shown the door. We're here to celebrate, uplift, and echo you. So get cozy, tune in, and let's embark on this journey together. Exploring the rich tapestry of women's lives, their battles, and victories, right here on What She Said. I took the long weekend off, which, well, standard for many, can be a rare treat when you're one of the 2.7 million Canadians who are self-employed. Stepping away from work isn't always easy, but it's crucial. So if you didn't manage a break this weekend, make sure to schedule some downtime every long weekend this summer. Trust me, I'm feeling refreshed and ready to conquer the world today, much like the trailblazing guests joining me on today's jam-packed show. Here's what's coming up. Today, we continue our in-depth exploration with the Ontario Pay Equity Office, we're tackling the often misunderstood topic of pay equity versus equal pay in the third installment of our six-part series. Commissioner Katie Philp joins me to clarify these crucial concepts and their importance in promoting a fair workplace. Anne Brody is back with some intriguing entertainment picks. She dives into the devastating impact of corporate trawlers on Newfoundland and Labrador's cod fishing industry with the film Sweetland, gives us a scoop on the Netflix miniseries Treason, and shares why Elsbeth is her new favorite TV show. I'm also joined by Jamie Liu, a distinguished professor, lawyer, and author, to discuss her latest book, Ghost Citizens. Jamie sheds light on the challenging realities of statelessness and the plight of individuals who, despite considering a country their home, remain unrecognized as citizens. Parents will definitely want to stick around for Allie Payne, who is here with essential tips for navigating the summer with your teens. With school out and free time in, Allie guides us on how to create a summer that's enjoyable while keeping our teens engaged and out of trouble. With summer no longer in our rearview mirror, Helen Stombos, founder and CEO of The Good Games, joins me to spotlight this remarkable festival that blends wellness, inclusion, and sport. Helen will share the inspiration and vision behind The Good Games, illustrating how this event harnesses the transformative power of sport to unite diverse communities, celebrate athletic endeavors, and promote a lifelong spirit of inclusivity and cultural celebration. And with rising consumer debt affecting many Canadians, Janet Gray from Money Coaches Canada will provide her expert insights. We'll examine the current debt landscape, its impact, and practical steps to manage financial challenges during these uncertain times. So stick around for these insightful conversations. We're jumping in right now. Today, we're diving into the third installment of a six-part series in partnership with the Ontario Pay Equity Office. We're unpacking a vital topic that often stirs up confusion, the distinction between pay equity and equal pay. I'm thrilled to have Commissioner Katie Philp here to help clarify these concepts and discuss their impact in the workplace. We're set to explore how these principles differ and why they are essential for fostering a fair and equitable work environment. Welcome back, Katie. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So I, I have to admit, on the surface, pay equity and equal pay sound very, very similar to me. Mm -hmm. So what is the actual difference between these two? It is a great question and two concepts that are often confused. So I'll start with the concept of equal uh, equal pay or equal equal work, because this is what mostly people understand it. So the idea here, you know, equal pay for equal work is covered by the Employment Standards Act. It's a fairly straightforward concept that says if two people are doing the same job or substantially the same job, they should be paid the same amount of money. So really simple example, if two people are working in a manufacturing line on the same line, moving the same product or good down the line or have really similar jobs, same working conditions, same level of effort responsibility, that would be uh, equal pay for equal work. The concept of pay equity, though, takes it a bit further and says, look it, 
we have a systemic problem where we have undervalued certain kinds of work in the labor market because they've been historically uh, done by women or legally prescribed to be done by women. We talked about some of the laws that kept women in certain um, uh, lower paid sectors. Um, but the pay equity says, no, we have to look at the value or the comparable worth, if you want it to understand it like that, of each job and compare that and really compare the level of skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions to get to the essence of the value being provided by that job and then adjusting uh, if un- there's unequal pay. Okay, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. Equal pay is mandated. It's law. Mm-hmm. It, it is enforced and, and it's across the board in Canada. Pay equity, as we discussed last time when we talked about the gender wage gap, is still very much present. And that's what we're looking to close, correct? Yes. Well, yes. And equal pay for equal work is something that is, I think, far more visible also, right? Because if you're standing beside somebody, I'm going to use the manufacturing line because it's it's easier. Uh, it's easy visual. If you're standing beside somebody on the line, you can very clearly say, I'm doing the same work as them. Why aren't I getting paid the same amount of money? So that's a much more visible um, inequality and much more straightforward to correct. Pay equity or pay inequity is less visible because you're comparing apples to oranges. You're saying, here's two entirely different jobs, um, but they're providing the same value to the company. And so we need to rethink the value that the jobs provide and adjust pay for that. So maybe it's helpful if I give you an example. Uh, Yes, please. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It's complicated stuff. So (laughs) let me give you an example of an animal control officer and a daycare worker. So as I mentioned, we look at, when you look at gender neutral job evaluations, you look at level of skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions. So on the surface, you might say an animal control officer and a daycare worker, you know, how can you compare those or how can you figure out who provides more value? Well, when you think of like education, you know, the gender stereotype of animal control officer, first of all, is male. For daycare, it's female. When you stop at education, you go, okay, wait, at minimum, to be an animal control officer, you need a high school diploma or equivalent, or maybe just on the job training, or maybe like a 30 hour course on animal welfare. But say for an early day child care worker, daycare workers, you typically need higher level of education, like, um, university, college, a bachelor's degree in early childhood education may require licensing, all of these types of steps, right? Uh, You may also both require animal control in early child care, first aid, medical training, uh, behavior management, you know, animal handling skills, people handling skills, animal child care, uh, sorry, animal child care, animal worker would need knowledge of animal laws um, and related emergency situations. Well, same with the daycare worker. They would need, you know, knowledge of child development, um, when you think about the effort that goes into those two jobs, okay, you know, you would say, well, animal control is pretty physically demanding because it may include lifting and restraining animals. It's emotionally demanding because it deals with dealing with distressed animals or impacted parties or emotional people um, and, you know, p- potentially aggressive animals. When you flip that with child care worker, well, also physically demanding, lifting and carrying and comforting children or engaging children and enclosed spaces, very emotional demanding. Uh, if there's any mothers out there, you know the requirements to attend to the emotional well-being of a child under the supervision, also dealing with maybe stressed out uh, parents. So there's a lot of strain. This, this comparison is beautiful, by the way, I might well, add. Well, it is because let me get to the punchline, okay? Uh, because when we talk about, you know, the safety of ensuring animal well-beings, you know, in safety ensuring children's well-being, um, exposure to pathogens, when you talk about animals and the risk of rabies, well, oh my God, exposure to childhood illness and human pathogens. Like, So when you think about this, you go, oh my God, these are two jobs. One is predominantly male, one is predominantly female. The average range for an animal control worker for hourly average is $34.21. The average job bank Canada rate for an early childhood educator is $20. So that's the jaw-dropping moment, right? And so this is the this is where pay equity comes in to say we've got to look at jobs based on all of these factors and the value they provide and adjust the the wages if they're providing the same level of skill under the same conditions. Oh, I get it now. That actually really helped clarify for that for me. That was perfect. Thank you. So is pay equity a widely adopted practice around the world? And how does Ontario's approach compare to others globally? 
Good question, because pay equity is still broadly understood as the first concept I said, equal pay for equal work, that very visible concept of, you know, two people doing the same job, needing the same compensation. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion in the global market and in even in global laws about pay equity, because I'll be reading a pay equity law sitting back going, well, this is actually really just an equal pay law. Um, so it's not as, as broadly um understood as it should be. Ontario, you know, was really the first jurisdiction globally to have pay equity laws, um, the sort of comparable worth that we just went through laws codified um, for public and private sectors. So we don't see many countries actually doing this. Um, There's only five countries globally that have pay equity defined as I've just explained it. This makes me feel a little bit better that I was struggling with the concept between uh, equal pay and pay equity uh, if, you know, governments around the world are still struggling with this concept a little bit too. So, you know, good to know and information is is powerful. So the more we know. Why is pay equity so crucial in the workplace, though? What makes it a key factor in promoting fairness? Sure. Well, I think, you know, overall, fairness and equality is just a vital part of of being human and human dignity. And so, you know, a lot of pay equity concepts are rooted in human rights law, anti-discrimination law. There's also a huge important piece for uh, economic justice. You know, you need economic justice broadly in society, but also in your in your workforce, if you're an employer, um, you know, employee satisfaction and engagement is going to be linked to the you know, level of economic justice that your employees believe they have. And having fair compensation practices, um, especially, you know, pay equity, because it's really this concept of comparable worth and saying, how much do we value certain jobs over others? And what does that compensation look like? But you have the gendered layer to it, because we know historically, we've talked about this, jobs that women have done have been undervalued. So when employers engage in this, they're really, you know, getting to economic and compensation justice, but also you're going to see increased employee satisfaction and engagement. Uh, There's also a huge reputational risk, I think, for companies who aren't doing this. Um, You know, adhering to pay equity, first of all, at least in Ontario, uh, many provinces across the country also have pay equity, but mostly for the just public sector. So, you know, in Ontario, it's adhering to the law. And if you're federally regulated, also adhering to the federal laws around this. Um, And I would say, you know, finally, also business performance. We've seen and we know that pay equity positively impacts business performance because you have people who come to work feeling valued, feeling engaged, feeling seen and feeling recognized for the work. So when you have, you know, pay equity that's tied into achieving gender equity and even, you know, racial diversity because you're doing this ideally intersectionally, you get a more innovative, resilient and competitive uh, working environment. I, I couldn't agree more. I hope I hope businesses are really absorbing that message, especially, you know, we do live in a call out culture. And as you said, you know, the yes. more people are informed, the more at risk you put your business if you're not following the law and, and you know, working towards, you know, pay equity for all. So, Katie, Absolutely. as usual, thank you so, so much for joining me. Uh, this was really enlightening. So there's going to be a blog post up on what she said, talk.com. That's going to dive into this a little bit deeper. And I think I just may take this example you shared today and, and sort of put it uh, in writing because it's it's beautifully explained. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And spoiler alert, we will be publishing that example in a big piece that we can share with you because it is a it's a great one that brings the concept home. Absolutely. All right. We'll see you next month. Hi, I'm Steve Yurko. And I'm Tara Sands. Now available from Maji Media is our new podcast, Four Kids Flashback. Four Kids is the company who brought you the English dub of Pokemon in the late 90s and so many other shows like Yu-Gi-Oh!, Shaman King, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Kirby, the infamous One Piece dub, and so many more. We'll be talking to the people who worked at Four Kids. Actors, directors, writers, editors, producers, engineers, you get the point. And hopefully get the answers to questions both you and I have about the company. I actually worked there as a voice actor on some of the shows. And I was a kid watching the shows and remember way more than Tara does. And thank God for that. Steve is actually a professional storyboard artist, which gives some really unique insights into anime and animation. Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts. That's the number four kids flashback.
It's time for Saturday Night at the Movies with Ann Brody. And Ann, let's jump right into it. I want to hear about Sweet Land. You know, it's funny. It's the second film in a couple of weeks after King uh, King Tide, both directed by Christian Sparks, about how the end of the cod fishing era in Newfoundland, Labrador, ruined communities. That happened, of course, when all the corporate fishers came in from around the world, intruding on Canada's waters and basically took all the fish so that the cod industry collapsed and the people who depended on the cod for food. You know, so the government here offers um, people on this very isolated island $100,000 per family to leave to go to the mainland. Um, And everyone has to accept it or the offer's off the table. Well, this fellow, Noah Sweetland, He's one of those rough, single, old-timey guys, and he refuses to go because his entire family, including his son, are buried there. He's in heaven. There's some scenes of him lying in the long grass, and he's just ecstatic. And he's, he's, you can understand his love for the land and the sea and the wind and all of that. Anyway, his best friend is a little boy who also doesn't want to leave. Um, And there's only one other person. So that's two adults don't want to leave, and they're holding everybody up. Anyway, this little boy, sweet and smart and inquisitive, he drowns. He slipped and drowns. And the guy's head turns around, and it's like he's got to rethink his life. So I'm going to leave it open there in terms of the plot. But the beauty of this film is its complexity and the profound emotions that are raised with very little scripting and very little sort of storyline stuff. Um, And it kind of tries your patience because it's long, but then, wow, it keeps sneaking up on you. And the the profound nature of this man's connection to the land and his his own idea of who he is uh, is so moving. And Mary Walsh has this terrific cameo in it. Um, I would highly recommend it. It's in theaters. I I actually remember very well this story as it played out in real life when these people were asked to leave that island and they were being paid by the government to leave. And I remember the news stories and thinking how heartbreaking this must be for so so many people to have to leave their home that was their home for generations for many of them. So, Hundreds of years. Um, yeah. So really, I it's interesting to see this now make its way to Pop film. culture. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Let's talk about Treason. This looks very Ooh, interesting to me. This is good. It's a mini series on Netflix. Uh, and the head of MI6, which is the um, British National uh, Espionage Bunch International, has a glass of wine. Now, the waitress serving him the wine um, makes a mistake that we would recognize right away, but he ignores it. So we have to wonder who she is. He drinks his wine and is hospitalized from poisoning. So he is no longer able to work, but he's alive. This puts a young career agent, Adam, played by Chris Cox, in the top job. He doesn't have much experience, and he's kind of terrified. His wife, a former soldier, is really supporting him in this journey. But he runs into a woman named Kara, who he once had an affair with. He, she's a double agent, and she's been pulling a lot of strings to make this whole sequence happen because she has influence over him. So without giving away a lot of the plot line, and it's pretty horrendous, the things that happen in the world of espionage that we don't know about, or at least as suggested here, is he and his wife have to flee London. So man, oh man, it is good. And the another interesting thing about it is uh, Mark Charman, who wrote The Incredible Bridge of Spies, wrote this. And both Tom Hanks and Mark Rylance take turns directing. So I would highly recommend it. Again, it's called Treason. All right, fantastic. Uh, And we have about a minute left. Do you want to talk about um, some film festivals happening? Oh, yes. We're heavily into film festivals here. Hot Docs is uh, uh, 
ending. The Jewish Film Festival lies ahead. So does the Japanese Film Festival and the Inside Out. This is the time. It seems counterproductive when the weather is getting so nice to go inside and watch a movie. But that's this is film season. And it's far removed from TIFF, as you'll notice. But, uh, you know, check online. There's so many films available to be seen, both in person and online, which is great. And can I just mention to you my new favorite fil- uh, TV show? Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Elspeth on Global. It's so funny and it's so um, unexpected. This woman joins the police force in New York City as an observer, but she gets gets all into the middle of these investigations. She's brighter than any of these detectives. And she's an, she's incredibly irritating <laughs> at first. And she's always carrying lots of shoulder bags and totes and things and wearing bright colors. But she, her personality is so delightful. I really enjoy it. And I, I'd recommend that too. All right. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. We'll look for Elsbeth on Global. All right, Anne, thanks so much. And we'll see you next week. All right, we'll see you next week. In this next interview, I'm joined by Jamie Liu, a distinguished professor, lawyer, and author whose work spans several critical aspects of immigration, refugee, and citizenship law. Jamie's latest book, Ghost Citizens, explores the deeply complex and often invisible issue of statelessness, particularly focusing on individuals who live in a country they consider home, but are not recognized as citizens. Through her compelling analysis, Jamie introduces us to the concept of ghost citizens and the dual oppression they face, being invisible yet feared by law. Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Candice. So can you start by explaining the concept of ghost citizens and what inspired you to explore this topic in your book? Yeah, I use the term ghost citizen in three ways. And the first is it depicts the experience of being stateless, that people feel like they've experienced an administrative death, that they might not uh, be living their full lives. Uh, And then secondly, the whole idea behind ghost citizens might be familiar to some of your listeners who are on the dating scene and get ghosted by their potential dates. in a way, you know, stateless people are being ghosted by the states that they consider their own. They aren't being answered um, properly in their citizenship applications are completely ignored. So there's this legal phenomenon happening where stateless people are being ghosted by states. And then the third phenomenon that I found in my research is that not only are states ignoring the applications or denying citizenship, they're also telling stateless people in certain legal venues we don't consider you a citizen here, but we think you're a citizen elsewhere. And therefore, we're going to confer this kind of fake citizenship on you just to say that you're not our problem. But there's no legal evidence or confirmation that this has happened. And so people remain stateless, despite the fact that states have conferred this kind of status on them in in legal venues and legal decisions. Is this a phenomenon that you feel is growing? Do you feel there are more and more stateless people globally than ever before? Yeah, I do think this is a common problem in especially the areas that I've studied. So the book really focuses on a number of cases in Malaysia, but a lot of my research focuses on cases in Canada. The common thread there is that they're both post-British colonial states and they have inherited British colonial citizenship laws and practices. And so I think where we find um, states who have a history of colonization and have used, you know, those kinds of practices in the past about how we categorize and racialize people into different categories, um, we might see this kind of practice over and over again. How, How do those colonial legacies continue to shape the issues of citizenship and identity in post colonial states? Through the law, you know, they're reproducing what was happening in colonial times, but also, you know, their ideas around citizenship are quite sticky and heavy. And so um, the fact that people might be identified as foreign, that practice of who gets to decide who is foreign is really rested with the state and they have a veto power in that sense. Um, and so it's, you know, this 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 notion that there is only um, the, you know, the strong arm of the state is really uh, doing that, despite the fact that community members themselves um, are embedded within our communities, right? And in Ghost Citizens, you discuss how legal systems both create and maintain 
statelessness. So can you elaborate on how contemporary laws contribute to this issue? And it, it maybe you have a specific example you could share? Yeah. One of the more famous examples in Canada is a gentleman by the name of Deepan Bulakoti, and he is a person who was born in Canada. Uh, and the facts are a bit murky. His parents were employed by someone who was working for the Consulate of India, and there was question of whether or not he was exempted from the Citizenship Act from get, getting citizenship. Got into trouble with the law um, criminally when he was older, and Canada deemed him a non-citizen and tried to deport him back to India. India has said he's not a citizen of India and they have no claim over him. He is stateless today. And this is all due to the same moves I talked about. The Canadian state is conferring Indian citizenship on this person, despite lack of proof, lack of confirmation from that foreign state. And secondly, they're completely ignoring the fact that he has longstanding, genuine, thick ties to Canada and have stripped him of citizenship that they previously recognized by giving him a Canadian passport several times in the past. So, you know, these kinds of things are happening. Um, people are living in limbo and suffering as a result of it. And this is just one example in Canada of um, this kind of phenomena. And what happens to these people when they are deemed stateless? I mean, they obviously can't uh, function as a member of society in Canada, like going to get loans or buy a home and things like that. I mean, where do they go? Yeah, they live in complete limbo and are at the mercy of people who might support them. So, you know, the number of people I know that are stateless, for example, in Canada and Malaysia are supported by NGOs, community members, but their lives are stuck. They can't go to university. They can't get proper employment. Um, some of them never... Um, you know, uh, get proper health care or proper housing are recriminalized through the process because they have to engage in criminal activity to support themselves. So it's a, a, it's a you know important social condition to really address because it can lead to other social problems. This feels like an under-examined issue. So how do you hope your book will influence the discourse on citizenship and human rights? Yeah, you know, my previous work um, touched on the issue of statelessness, and I remember getting emails and, you know, handwritten letters from readers who told me that they'd never heard of this phenomenon before. And so I really hope that this work really sheds light, as you say, on a very under-examined and unknown or not well-known problem, um, and that it is more common than we think it is. And that I think for us as a community to think about the responsibility we have to these people, you know, they are with us. Uh, they have enduring links and ties. And how do we bring them back into the fold and welcome them as, um, you know, functioning and contributing members of our society? How can we be shifting our policy to help people who are stateless? Yeah, I think, you know, on the one hand, we should be critiquing the way that the courts and the government counters treat people. But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about who belongs in Canada and who are foreigners. And I think, you know, we have to have a really, I think, um, strong look and reflection about, you know, as, as a nation state, what do we want to build together and who do we want to include in that? And how do we ensure that people who have longstanding links here um, can contribute and, and in turn, you know, take up the responsibilities of being a citizen in Canada? And, and throughout the book, you engaged with stateless individuals and their advocates, and you shared one story about a gentleman in Canada. But is there another particularly impactful story or insight that shaped your understanding even more of this? Yeah, um, there was a young woman named Roysa who I dedicate a chapter to in the book, and she at the time was stateless when I met her. She has since obtained citizenship. But that story really touched me in the sense that she was a young woman um, who was quite resilient and willing to talk publicly about her story. Um, and it was only through this kind of public campaign to perform um, a good citizen that she was able to get citizenship. You know, she uh, performed, you know, language skills. She, she showed her report cards as a straight A student. She showed she was a devout Muslim woman wearing a hijab and knew the customs of, of Malaysia. And so to me, you know, that's what a lot of people do here in Canada to, to kind of get accepted. A lot of people learn our languages to try to get rid of their accent, but you know, at, at what cost? And so I want people to think about that too, you know, that there's a lot of performance involved in being welcomed and being brought into our societal fold um, and to think about what we really mean when it means that we live in a multicultural and diverse society. 
I mean, aside from people listening to the show right now and myself, who do you want this book? Who do you really want to read this book and and hold the message? I think anybody who has absolutely no knowledge of this whatsoever, um, I would I would welcome it to anybody who's curious about these kinds of things. I do kind of fold, you know, kind of a folktale motif and a little bit of the horror genre into the book. So if anybody's interested in that, I think they should pick it up. Um, but also anybody who is interested in understanding the ways in which, um, you know, uh, people might suffer as a result of just complete lack of legal status. It, it is really hard to understand how just that status can really upend and, and make your life um, completely miserable and how important it is to have citizenship. It, it sounds like a complete nightmare, to be honest. It is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I, it is a bit of a horror, really. You're stateless. You you. It would be difficult to get employment. You need money to be able to fight it. It really just feels like this sort of vicious circle that people f- must find themselves in. So I can't imagine how frustrating that is. Uh, Jamie, I can't thank you enough for joining me today to to really shed light on this. I I'd never heard of of ghost citizens before, and I think this is a really crucial discussion. So where can people find the book, and where can they keep up with you? Yeah, they can find the book at any bookstore that they like to frequent. Um, I would advise people to try as much as possible, buy your books from independent bookstores. Um, And you can find me, I'm on Instagram at JCYLU and on Twitter slash X or whatever it's called now. (laughs) And uh, on my website, jcylu.com. All right. Well, for the record, we call it Twitter here on what she said. We'll we'll never call it X. So we'll stick with Twitter. All right, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Candice. Thanks for having me. Parents of teens, you're going to want to turn up the volume on this one and find a place to take notes because Allie Payne is here with tips for surviving this summer with your teen. As the school year winds down and the summer breaks kick off, it's not just the temperatures heating up, it's also the challenge of keeping your teen occupied and out of trouble. Today, Allie, our expert on parenting teens, is here to guide us through setting up a summer that's enjoyable and memorable for the right reasons. Allie, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited about this topic. Oh, this is a big one, I'm sure. So summer break, obviously, is a double-edged sword for parents and teens alike. Let's acknowledge teens don't love this either. So can you explain why this time can be particularly challenging for teens? Yeah, absolutely. Because as a teen, if you remember, it's probably like, ah, finally, like no responsibilities, unlimited gaming or movie marathons or night late nights out and doing whatever you want. It's ultimate freedom. And then parents are saying, uh, no, not so fast, (laughs) not so fast. Exactly. What about, you know, maybe learning a life skill, maybe getting a job. And you're certainly not sitting on your trish all day long. If I'm working, you're going to like contribute and help to the house. So there's this, there's this constant, like, Oh, like I just want to rest and I just leave me alone. And then parents saying, um, yeah, well life actually happened. So let's pick up and get up. So Absolutely. So you've talked about the the importance of balancing downtime with responsibility. How can parents encourage their teens to contribute to household chores without turning every request into a battle? Oh, yeah. 100%. You must sit down and negotiate these as it were an agreement, not a contract. I did not say a contract. A contract is written so you make sure you get out what you put in. It is only about you. This is an agreement and you negotiate it. If your teen is not working or even if they are working part or full time, you negotiate what chores or responsibilities are they going to have around the house? When do each of them need to get done? And what exactly does done look like? Because your teen is not you. They're not going to care like you and they're not going to do it like you. So without expecting perfection, negotiate this kind of thing, put it in writing, put it in a really visible place so that your teen, and then let go of the reminders asking your teenager what support do they need to create structure or reminders for themselves, knowing that when you're adding a chore, um, you know, teenagers do, their brain absolutely is not developed for time management, prioritization in that time management. 
They lack the cues that exist during a structured time, like getting up for school, lunch. When there's no structure, would they lack cues? So this is about helping them build those cues, which it enables their executive function development. But you've got to negotiate this in the beginning, up front, put it on the fridge. Do not be so rigid that you cannot be flexible when they have other commitments. And remember, their brains are still learning. So you've got to let them fail without rescuing them and keep asking how you can support them to create cues or time management or prioritization that works for them. Here's one I think that everybody's going to struggle with. I mean, even I think about it and go, yeah, I kind of look forward to my downtime when I can just scroll because nothing is, is yes. you know, pulling me in another direction. And for teens, you know, they've just finished school year. They're thinking, woohoo, TikTok, here I come. And <laughs> so what strategies can parents use to negotiate tech use that satisfies both their need for relaxation and the parent's desire for moderation? Right. Now, I want to make it really clear that the teen brain The adolescent brain development actually needs an extraordinary amount of unstructured nothingness time. Now, I know as a parent myself, you would prefer your teenager not spend that entire time with a screen in front of their face. I absolutely hear you. Yes. So your teenager is growing up in a digital era that you didn't. Okay, that's not their fault. It's their problem. It's not their fault. Okay, because let's remember which generation created the technology. Anyway. I think it's important to understand they connect with their friends this way. So it's a social activity in some way. So if you say to them, and I'm just using hypotheticals here. Okay, you get four hours of technology time a day. It You can use that whenever you want, but it that's it. And you either use the screen time controls on their phone or you use your free app from your internet service provider and you control when the Wi-Fi is available or when each um, device can have access, et cetera. You can also contact your cell phone provider to work that out. And then the, if they have a basic amount of time, let's say they get two hours time just to just connect with friends, say hi, get, like, what are you doing? All of the things. Then Based on that list of tasks that we already talked about that are regularly um, scheduled and they they can work out when they do that, maybe once those basics are done, then they get their additional two hours, okay? And maybe if there's larger projects they're doing or things you need extra help with that day, maybe they can earn a little more technology time. I want to be really careful, though that you choose a time that is reasonable. It's going to feel like too much for you and it's going to feel like not enough for them. Then you're probably right in the middle that this isn't about requiring them to manage that time because they do not have the uh, impulse control and emotional regulation to say, oh, it's been four hours. I will put my phone down now. That is not ever going to happen. So please just stop expecting that. There needs to be automation involved that also isn't you controlling and monitoring. And that I don't don't create a situation where your teen gets no tech time unless they do X, Y, Z every time because you're creating a transaction that they are always um, having to, they get a reward every time they do. It turns into a little bit too much carrot and stick. So yeah. stick with a basic amount, then maybe there's a break or they have to do, they get their chores done or what have you, and then they get the rest. And there's a way for them to earn more based on, again, agreements, what feels reasonable. Any tips for parents in helping um, their kids find and keep a summer job? This is a big one. And I struggled with this with my own teenagers. So I, oh my goodness, I was so angry with them. My kids refused. And they're really good kids. They like flat out refused. So their dad and I came up with very large extra projects like sanding and restaining the deck. They had to refinish our kitchen table. Now, yes, they both love woodwork and they love working together. So it was a really good collaborative thing that they needed to do. As far as finding the job for your teen, do not go and give them all of the things that are available. Please, again, enable their executive function, get them to start looking. And generally speaking, a lot of the jobs that they're going to start out with might not even be posted anywhere. So it might be about asking their friend's parents Or you can say, would you like me to ask so-and-so for a certain list? Do not go and just do it for them. And then you can talk to them about what a basic resume would look like. A lot of high schools, they have to do this in class anyway. 
and or you might need to give them rides to go and drop off that resume. Uh, a lot of national companies that are international are now all online anyway. Maybe you sit and help them do that. Try uh, Give them a timeline. What I think works better is giving them a budget. And I know we're going to talk about that in a second, but if it's all about getting a job, there's a lot that happens behind this that they hear, you're lazy, you're lazy, you're lazy. And what actually is coming out of you is, I resent the amount of rest you have that I want. Mm -hmm. And that is not their problem. So make it easy, low entry, something that they enjoy is not wildly in their anxiety range, that they can transport themselves to and from quite easily without a lot of rides, maybe start with part time before full time. Um, and go go with that. Yeah. And don't forget, if, if, they're, if they're not driving yet, you're likely going to be the driver. So you have That's to account right. for that time in your schedule as well. Uh, quickly, we don't have a lot of time left. Did you want to touch on budgeting quickly? Yes. If they um, require money for either activities or a particular hobby or something that you would like them to now start contributing to, help them develop a budget so they can see what a dollar per hour job is minus taxes because they always forget that, what the net pay is and the number of hours per week. That often makes things more manageable so it doesn't feel so completely overwhelming and they feel unmotivated and completely anxious about even starting. So break it down into tiny bits and also make sure that their budget allows for personal expenditures and having a little bit of fun with friends so they start to see the win in them having their own money instead of making a summer off of your money. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, especially in this economy. I'm sorry, kids, you're going to have to go out and earn it on your own. Goodness, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So, Allie, uh, I know parents could have more questions and probably more struggles uh, on this front. So where can they connect with you and find out more? Best places on my website, AllyPayne.com, A-L-Y-P-A-I-N.com, or on social media at Allie Payne. All right. Fantastic, Allie. Thanks so much for this. Thanks, Kim. In the heart of summer, when the spirit of competition and camaraderie lights up the air, Canada gears up for an extraordinary celebration of athleticism and culture. The Good Games, a beacon of wellness, inclusion, and the transformative power of sport, returns to the University of Guelph from July 6th to 7th. This year, the festival takes on an even more profound significance as it becomes a pivotal stop on the road to the Masters Indigenous Games. Joining me today is Helen Stombos, the visionary founder and CEO of The Good Games and a distinguished figure in Canadian sports history. Helen's journey from scoring Canada's first ever World Cup goal to spearheading this inclusive sporting festival embodies the essence of sport for all, sport for life. Today, she's here to share the excitement, the inclusivity, and the sheer joy that The Good Games promised to every participant and spectator. Welcome to What She Said, Helen. Hey, thanks for having me. The Good Games has quickly become a hallmark event in Canada's sporting calendar. Can you share the inspiration behind creating such a diverse and inclusive festival of sport? Sure. I think, you know, sports kind of been part of my life growing up, obviously. It's what I did <laughs> throughout my childhood. Um, and then as I got to be an adult, you know, those opportunities to play and compete are limited. You know, um, I started playing after my soccer career ended, I started playing in a beach volleyball league. And I remember we went to tournaments and I thought, oh, this is so fun. Like that camaraderie, the social environment, the friendships that you encounter. Um, and they're so few and far between when you reach a certain age, but they're so needed. So if, you know, if anybody knows my story and my history of what I went through, I, I will always, um, comment on the transformative power of sport and kind of what it's done for me. It literally has has healed me, uh, has taken me out of the depths of depression and helped me become a healthier mentally person. And that was strictly because of what sport brought to the table for me. You know, it's funny, I hadn't really thought of of this aspect of it until this came across my email. But yeah, you're right, because we do hit that stage where we move out of extracurriculars, we're out of school and finding these opportunities you know, unless you're a professional athlete, finding these opportunities to compete becomes much harder. Yeah, yeah. And there's tons of stats out there and how, you know, being healthy and active contributes to your overall health, you know, well-being, whether it's mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, 
all of it. And, and there's just not that even the social part, like I think a lot of people that I'm speaking to about the games, I mean, they talk about bringing their teams and traveling here and being having that experience as a team and as friends um, that you do with kids. Like as when you're a kid, I mean, you go to soccer tournaments all the time, you're always playing, you're always there with your friends. So it was creating an atmosphere like that, that that was a little bit different than just like a one sport tournament. So, you know, I would go play in a beach volleyball tournament, and I'd be there with all my beach volleyball friends. But I had experienced multi sport games as an athlete. Um, I'd experienced them in my career post, like going to Olympic Games. I had been in Vancouver for the um, uh, Masters, uh, America's Masters Games. And, and I thought, you know, there's really nothing that fills that gap for people, that gives them something to be excited about um, annually, to go to something, to really still play with your teammates or still connected with your university teammates, your college teammates, your high school teammates, whatever it might be. And just gathering the troops again and showing up for an event that you could just have fun with. Um, and compete. I mean, I think we all still love competing. I still love competing. Uh, maybe I don't take it as seriously as I used to when I was younger, but I still love to get out there and compete and to have a, a venue where you could like put it on your calendar every year and know that I'm going to the good games. And it's not just my sport playing there. I mean, this year we have 12 sports playing and competing over that weekend and people from all over North America. We have even for the women's soccer competition, we have players coming from Hawaii, all over the States. So it becomes a really great um, uh, place where you can just come experience different sports, enjoy a festival atmosphere and compete at the same time. And we, we made our festival free so the athletes can come compete, but the festival is just there for, for you to entertain you. Um, and it's funny because the festival part is actually one aspect that I didn't kind of expect was it became very popular beyond just the athletes. So now the festival's kind of become a beast of its own where people from all over are coming now to the festival and, you know, we akin it to the Calgary Stampede where you don't have to be in the rodeo to go to the Stampede. Um, you can go to the Stampede and just enjoy the extracurricular activities there and you get people from all over the world. And that's kind of what's happening here is our festival is truly a festival of sport. You come and it's everything that you'll encounter there will either be get involved and get active, try something out. There's lots of learn to play pickleball, learn to play dodgeball, learn to play walking soccer, um, or there's activations that you can watch, like the Canadian Freestyle Soccer Championships are going to be on. We're hosting a CrossFit competition that you can watch. So there's a uh, beach volleyball. We're putting up a court in the festival area where you can watch Olympians and pros compete. It's kind of a little bit of everything for everyone. So it's it's a truly sport festival, whereas, you know, normally people think, festival and they think music and you know entertainment and I'm like yeah we're we are that we have that but we're we're mostly sport at this year you're partnering with the indigenous sport and wellness council of ontario so how does this collaboration enrich the festival and what unique indigenous sport and cultural activities can attendees look forward to sure um you know when we started to um come up with the concept of this i always thought i would love this to be a purely inclusive event like welcome everyone. And, and I feel like that's how we heal. We just all come together and sport has such a unifying force. Um, so um, the partnership with the Indigenous Sport and Wellness Council, um, they're coming and they're part of the, the entire event. They're putting on an archery competition uh, and that's pretty cool, but they're also bringing Indigenous athletes to compete in some of our other competitions. But they will be there also with a cultural slash sport activation gr uh, booth as well. So they're putting on some cultural experiences um, a lot of what we offer and, and what they're going to offer there is, is really experiential. So they're putting on a lacrosse showcase where you can go learn to play lacrosse. Um, you can test out some of the, we're, we're looking at bringing a high jump uh, showcase, which is a very indigenous sport. Um, anything that kind of introduces people to anything unique and different. And I love that they're coming to share their experience. You know, it's one thing to, you know, do a welcome and honor, but it's another thing to actually include. Um, I think that's where that's where healing starts is we just have to start bringing together all people and and building it. And I think sport is the perfect backdrop for that. And I, I think the Indigenous Sport and Wellness Council, I've worked with them before and and helped them out in some of their sport endeavors. And I could just see how important sport was to healing youth. And if we can bring everyone in an environment together and, and just show how it's such a unifying force, sport can just bring everything together together. And so, yeah, they'll, they're going to be there all weekend. We'll have uh, lots of different cultural experiences. We'll have lots of different um, showcases from the Indigenous perspective. 
Uh, we're looking at doing a friendship dance to end the event, um, which is a very uh, unique thing to do as well. Um, and then, of course, they're putting on their own archery competition, which is uh, is going to be really cool to include them in that. And we're we're becoming kind of one of their stops on their road to the Masters Indigenous Games. So they have the Masters Indigenous Games every two years. Next year uh, is 2025. So this year we're kind of their, one of their stops on that road. We don't have a lot of time left, and I feel you may have a hard time answering this, but I'm going to ask it. For someone who might be attending the Good Games for the first time, what would you say is the one experience they absolutely should oh. miss? Oh, gosh, that is so hard. Um, I would say um, because it was such a, a main attraction last year was we we built a beach volleyball court, like an Olympic beach volleyball court right in the middle of the festival. And um, that was the one thing that really brought in a lot of uh, attendees from all over the place because we had former Olympians playing there. We had former national championships, former professional athletes, and then we had the music and the DJ and we did some uh, interactive fun stuff with the audience as well. I would say the beach volleyball and the beach volleyball court uh, right in the middle of the festival is probably the heart of the festival. People want to get involved. Uh, you know, how do they get involved in maybe participating, uh, if not for this year, perhaps for next? And if they want to attend, where can they find out more information? Sure. I mean, I think everything's pretty much on our website, the good dot games um, and uh, all the sports the competitions, how you register how you get involved. Obviously, you know, we need volunteers too. So, you know, how you can become a volunteer, but everything is on there kind of explains, you know, what we are, what we're building, uh, all the sports competitions and uh, what different sports we're offering this year and how you can actually register. Or if you want to just attend, you'll find out what's happening actually at the festival. We'll have schedules up. We'll update people on what kind of is involved because as we kind of grow this, we find that more and more happens. Uh, like we're getting a lot more interest with people that want to be there. Um, so it, it's changing very rapidly, but it, it's a very, very unique event. I don't think there's anything like it in, in Canada for sure. Um, and it's a very, if you like sport and you like being active, I think this is the one event that I would put on your calendar. Absolutely. I think this is wonderful. Helen, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. And uh, I'm going to put the links to this in, in the blog post when this goes live. Uh, and uh, we'll have you back again soon. Thanks, Candice. As Canadians grapple with rising consumer debt, understanding its implications and seeking solutions has become more important than ever. In this next interview, we're taking a closer look with Janet Gray from Money Coaches Canada. With her extensive experience as a certified financial planner and her regular contributions to major media outlets, Janet offers a unique perspective on the financial challenges many Canadians are facing right now. So let's explore the current debt landscape, its impact on our daily lives, and the steps we can take to navigate these uncertain times. Welcome to What She Said, Janet. Hello. So so consumer debt in Canada has reached a new record high. So can you give us a snapshot of the current situation and why this is so concerning? Well, you know, it, it seems like it's surprising, but I don't think it is a surprise. I mean, of course it's going to be high. Um, people have taken on debt, whether they mean it mean it in ways that they have to spend for on their basics. Like some people are using it to buy their groceries and, and then they don't have the means to repay it. Other people have been impacted by rising mortgage variable rates. So now they don't have the means to pay their credit cards. So it's impacting all levels of income. Although people, of course, with lower incomes are having a harder time to find the surplus to make payments. This is incredibly stressful. Not, I mean, not for a small minority of people. I mean, the majority of Canadians are feeling the stress. So how do you see this manifesting in the day-to-day -day lives of individuals and families? Hard choices. I mean, and tough choices. I mean, like I say, some people don't have the money. They, they have to put the groceries, gas on their credit cards with no expectation of ever paying it down and maybe not even meeting the interest payments on that debt. It's it's hard. It's going to be hard choices. People need to maybe take a closer look at where they're actually spending the money and then backstepping and, and really, you know, here's what's needed. 
and here's what's wanted. The wants are going to have to wait and crunch down on what's needed and maybe even look at the needed. You know, do some decisions when you're making your, doing your groceries. I'm buying no name. I'm not buying as much meat. I'm not buying, you know, vegetables out of season and stuff, making decisions. But that comes on having an awareness around your situation. And in times like this, when people are stress motivated, it's really hard to have that contemplation space to think these things through a little bit more. For those people who are able to, you know, look at their financial goals and still perhaps address some of them without, you know, you know, putting groceries on credit cards, which is just breaking my heart, um, you know, what can they do to, you know, still work towards the financial goals while dealing with all of these additional financial stressors? Yeah. It, and again, it's, it's really having a plan, right? A planner is going to say that. It's about having a plan. It's knowing that you might have two streams. You might have a stream of your surplus that's paying down debt, but at the same time, you still want to live your life and have some fun and enjoyment. So maybe you're going to, you know, agree that it may take me four years to pay down that debt. You know, that's reasonable. But at the same time, I'm saving towards other goals that are as important or more important, potentially. Do you have any advice for people who are now, you know, looking at delinquencies, uh, defaulting on loans, perhaps looking at bankruptcy? Speak up. You need to get professional help. You need to speak to a credit counselor or bankruptcy counselor, see what your options are. Call your credit card company. Tell them you are having some difficulty. See if there's anything that they can suggest. Sometimes if it's due to a medical condition, they can actually give you some uh, space on making those payments. They can freeze the interest payments. Um, so speak to your lenders. The absence is of, of um, interchange of, of a conversation with them is not good. If they don't hear from you, they presume that you're just you know blowing them off. They You need to let them know that I'm consciously wanting to do that. I'm just not able to. I wanted to let you know I'm going to try hard. I can send you 10 bucks, but I can't send you 100 bucks. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. Get some help. And do you feel that people avoid these conversations because there is a shame attached to to this? Absolutely. Shame, guilt, embarrassment, um, you know, judgment. You know, people are, are harsh in harsh times. And, you know, be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, knowing that, you know, what's the expression before God? No, by the grace of God, you know, it's kind of like, if it's not you, it could be me. So be very empathetic and sympathetic to others and understand that someday you could be in that position. Like I said, it's not just low incomes that are affected. Some people's like higher incomes, they're paying exorbitant amounts. And I'm not talking high, like a millionaire. I'm talking about people that are making, you know, high, high hundred thousands or something. They're feeling the pain too. A little bit more, you know, flexibility, of course, but it's not, it's the, the gift that's giving to all income levels. And I hope that this, you know, obviously ends soon and we start to see some light at the end of the tunnel. But are there proactive measures people can be taking to ensure, you know, they're prepared for future economic uncertainties? Sure. Well, a lot of it is um, being aware of your situation. Like, you know, keeping track of where you're spending your money is a good start. Knowing what your future plans are and knowing that there is always going to be an emergency. If it's not your house, it's your car. If it's not one of those, it could be your pet. It could be a kid. There's always going to be a need for extra money. So go ahead and set aside some extra money. And again, start slowly. If you can only set aside 10 bucks a pay, then start building so that you know that when this happens again, I've got a little bit of a safety cushion here that can offset some of that, you know, and, and, and plus the awareness that you're building will make you a little more in tune to see those things a little farther away than waiting till they're right in front of your face. All right. Janet, you are always sharing great information everywhere. Uh, I can't keep up with you. You are literally everywhere lately. So where can people uh, find you and, and, you know, get great information from you on other channels? I think the best place is, I mean, Google me on Facebook. I, uh, Google me on Facebook seems strange, but yeah, find me on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, but also go to our website. There's lots of resources there. It's moneycoachescanada.ca. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. My pleasure. If today's podcast resonated with you, spread the word and share the inspiration. Don't forget to hit subscribe on what she said across your favorite podcast platforms. Crave more? 
Join my vibrant community by signing up for my newsletter at whatshesaidtalk.com and let's get social on Facebook, Instagram, and X at What She Said Talk. Dive into my world a little deeper on TikTok and threads at Candace Said. And for those who love the airwaves, catch me weekly on 105.9 The Region, Blast the Radio, and 1077 Pulse FM. Until next time, keep making waves and remember, your voice matters. I'm Andrea Askowitz. And I'm Allison Langer. And we are the hosts of Writing Class Radio, a podcast, but we are so much more. We have writing classes. So if you are looking for live online classes where you can join a community, write to a prompt, get feedback, and get better, check out all our classes at writingclassradio.com. And listen to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts and at writingclassradio.com. Come on a journey like no other, where you will discover many rogues that will lead you to a happier, healthier, and more stress-free life. And the beauty is, you don't need any vacation time for this adventure. The journey will come to you. Join Avery Rich on your very own journey into yoga. Along the way, she will demystify yoga poses and guide you into a yoga posture or short sequence, all in less than 15 minutes. You have nothing to lose but stress. The Journey Into Yoga podcast. It's not for people who like yoga. It's for people who don't like yoga. Follow or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at AveryRich.com. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.